Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to Episode 71 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about the mysterious death of CIA scientist Frank Olson. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. Shortly after midnight on November 28th, 1953, 65 years ago this week, and two days after the Thanksgiving holiday, a man in New York City plummeted to his death out of his hotel room window. That man was a scientist named Dr. Frank Olson. His family was told it was an accident, and for decades they accepted this story. But in the 1970s, the story began to deepen. What emerged involved the CIA, biowarfare, LSD, and maybe murder. And that's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. So, Jimmy, what happened on November 28th, 1953? Well, that's the big question, isn't it? We'll start with what no one disputes. This happened in 1953, which was during the McCarthy era, when Senator Joseph McCarthy of Wisconsin was whipping people up into a frenzy of fear about claimed Soviet infiltration of the U.S. government. That doesn't play a direct role in the story, but it, it's important to understand the climate of fear that was around at the time, because the climate of fear does play a role in the story. Earlier in that evening, uh, Dr. Frank Olson and a colleague named uh, Dr. Robert Lashbrook had gone to their room in the Hotel Statler. Today, it's called the Hotel Pennsylvania on 7th Avenue in Manhattan, across the street from Pennsylvania Station and Madison Square Garden. They were staying in room 1018A, and because of that, many people have assumed it was on the 10th floor. But hotels like to renumber the rooms creatively <laughs> to keep people from realizing they're staying on the 13th floor. And actually, room 1018A is on the 13th floor mm. of the Statler Hotel. So he actually fell 13 stories to his death. At about 2.30 a.m., uh, Frank Olson, clad only in his underwear, crashed through the glass of a closed window and plummeted 13 stories to the street below. He landed on his back, but he was still alive and his eyes were open. The night manager of the hotel rushed out to him. A priest arrived and gave him last rites. He looked up at the night manager and tried to speak, but he couldn't be understood. And he took a deep breath and he died and he was 43 years old. So who was Frank Olson? He was the son of Swedish immigrants who had arrived in the country in 1890, 20 years before he was born. Uh, he was born in 1910 in Hurley, Wisconsin. And at the University of Wisconsin, he earned a Bachelor of Science and a Doctorate in Bacteriology. He worked for Purdue University in Indiana. He was a captain in the U.S. Army Chemical Corps. And as a civilian, he was recruited by his university advisor, Dr. Ira Baldwin, to go to work for a secret government program at Camp Dietrich in Maryland. That's now Fort Dietrich, but at the time, Camp Dietrich. He was a civilian employee of the Department of the Army, and he was a family man. Uh, his wife was named Alice, and together they had three children, a daughter named Lisa, a son named Nils, and another son named Eric. When did his family hear about his death? Just two to three hours later, uh, his son Eric remembers being awakened around 4.30 or 5 in the morning and receiving the news. It was delivered by another colleague of Frank's named Vincent Ruitt. Eric remembers Ruitt saying, your father had an accident. He fell or jumped out a window. Soon uh, they received the body back, but it was in a sealed casket and the family was told it was too badly damaged for viewing. As a result, they didn't get to see their father. He, was simply, he had simply gone to New York, vanished, and then they got this casket back, which they buried. What happened after his family was told? Every family member dealt with their grief in their own way. Alice, frankly, slid into alcoholism, at least for a time. The family member who's been the most outspoken has been Eric. 
And at this time in his life, Eric was nine years old, and he, like a lot of boys do, really identified with his father. Uh, As a result, it was an especially wrenching event for his father to die and for Eric not to have even seen the body afterwards, to just have his father vanish. Eric began to ruminate on what Vincent Ruitt had told him, that his father had an accident and fell or jumped from a window. If his father, he found himself thinking, you know, well, if his father fell out the window, it was an accident. But if he jumped out the window, it wasn't an accident. And so he just kept having this cycle of thoughts about how do these terms fit together if it's an accident, but he jumped and it doesn't make sense. And he talked to, tried talking to his mom about this, but she started replying that they'd already discussed the matter and she didn't want to talk about it. And she also apparently repeatedly told him, you're never going to know what happened in that room. And Eric kind of stayed quiet for many years. What happened to change that? In 1974, Eric, now a young man, was home for the Thanksgiving holiday, and he asked his mother to tell him the story of his father's last days once again. She reluctantly agreed and talked about how Frank Olson had gone to an office retreat at a place called the Deep Creek Lodge, and when he got home, he was upset. He said, I made a terrible mistake, but he didn't say what it was. He said he wanted to quit his job and become a dentist. Alice then took him to the movies, and they saw the new 1953 biopic, Martin Luther. In his book, The Men Who Stare at Goats, British author John Ronson notes an interesting fact about this movie. TV Guide's movie review database gives Martin Luther two out of five stars and says, It's not entertainment in the usual sense of the word. One wishes there might have been some humor in the script to make the man look more human. The film was made with such respect that the subject matter seems gloomy when it should be uplifting. And here's what Frank and Alice Olson actually heard at the climax of the film. My conscience is captive to the word of God. To go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Therefore, I cannot and I will not recant. Here I stand. I can do no other. Afterwards, Alice conceded that this might not have been the best movie to take her husband to see while he was having a crisis of conscience at work. Yeah. Ronson picks up the story. The trip to the cinema didn't help Frank's mood, and the next day it was suggested by some colleagues that he go to New York to visit a psychiatrist. Alice drove Frank to Washington, D.C. and dropped him off at the offices of the men who would accompany him to New York. This was the last time she ever saw her husband. On the spur of the moment, during that Thanksgiving weekend in 1974, Eric asked his mother a question he'd never thought to ask before. Describe the offices where you dropped him off. So she did. Eric uttered an expletive and said, That sounds just like CIA headquarters. And then Eric's mother became hysterical. She screamed, You will never find out what happened in that hotel room. But Eric vowed that he would find out. So how did he start to learn more? That same year, 1974, the New York Times had been reporting on illegal activities by the CIA in the United States. By law, the CIA is not supposed to conduct domestic operations. It's meant to spy on other nations, not on American citizens. That is the FBI's job. (laughs) For our British listeners, the FBI is sort of our equivalent of MI5, and the CIA is sort of our equivalent of MI6. In response to the new reports, and in the wake of the Watergate scandal that we talked about in Episode 7, the new president, Gerald Ford, appointed a commission to look into the CIA's activity. It was headed by the new vice president, Nelson Rockefeller, and it became known as the Rockefeller Commission. On June 11th, 1975, Eric received a phone call from a family friend telling him to look at that day's edition of the Washington Post. On the front page was a story titled, Suicide Revealed. It said, A civilian employee of the Department of the Army, 
unwittingly took LSD as part of a Central Intelligence Agency test, then jumped 10 floors to his death less than a week later, according to the Rockefeller Commission report released yesterday. The man was given the drug while attending a meeting with CIA personnel working on a test project that involved the administration of mind-bending drugs to unsuspecting Americans. This individual was not made aware he had been given LSD until about 20 minutes after it had been administered, the commission said. He developed serious side effects and was sent to New York with a CIA escort for psychiatric treatment. Several days later, he jumped from a 10th floor window of his room and died as a result. Eric immediately wondered if this was his father. If this was his father. After all, how many civilian employees of the Department of the Army are there who are jumping to their deaths from their New York hotel rooms? And he was right. It was his father. And now he knew that for some reason, the CIA had covertly drugged his father with LSD, and this somehow led to his death. So how did the family react to this? They were surprised. They ended up going to the White House where President Ford apologized to them for what had happened, you know, even though he wasn't directly involved. He still, on behalf of the American people and the government, apologized to them. And apparently this meeting went very well, and Alice was very moved by President Ford. Uh, They also went to CIA headquarters where the current head of the CIA, William Colby, also apologized to them. And he gave them a set of papers uh, relating to Frank's death and the circumstances leading up to it. Those papers are now online at the Frank Olson Project, and we'll have a link to them so you can read them for yourself. Despite these gestures, the family planned to sue for compensation, but the government offered them an out-of-court settlement. Initially, they offered one and a quarter million dollars, but it ended up being reduced to just three quarters of a million dollars. And the family ended up taking the offer, and they had to sign an agreement not to sue. What did the family learn about the work Frank Olson was doing for the CIA? The children would have been learning most or all of this for the first time. Uh, But Alice would have known at least something about Frank's work. I mean, as an adult, she knew that that she was married to a bacteriologist who was working for the Army, And she and the other wives in the unit all guessed the basic fact that their husbands were doing biological warfare research for the Army. I mean, what else is a bacteriologist working for the Army in the McCarthy era of the Cold War going to be doing? But she wouldn't have known the details of what he was doing because of government secrecy. So it emerged that, well, okay, guess what? The details included him experimenting with aerosolized anthrax or what we today would call weaponized anthrax, anthrax bacilli that have been conditioned so that they can be released in aerosol form and infect people and give them lung anthrax, which is the most deadly kind. Alice also likely knew he was working with the CIA because she was in the car when he was taken to CIA headquarters in preparation for going to New York. So again, she wouldn't have had known, wouldn't have known the details, but in fact, he had been working on Project Bluebird, which then, which is a CIA project. It then changed its name to Project Artichoke, and then it changed its name to Project MK Ultra. MK Ultra was a secret CIA program run by a man named Dr. Sidney Gottlieb. Its purpose was to ins- explore the possibility of human mind control. And we will definitely be discussing Sidney Gottlieb (laughs) and MKUltra in the future. Also, Gottlieb's deputy running MKUltra was a man named Richard Lashbrook, who was the man in the hotel room with Frank Olson when he went out the window. So that's how close to the head of MKUltra Olson was. So how did the CIA explain Olson's death? They claimed that on November 18th, 1953, 10 days before his death, Frank Olson and 10 other individuals participated in a retreat at Deep Creek Lake, Maryland. During that meeting, Sidney Gottlieb, the head of the MKUltra project, spiked a bottle of the orange-flavored liqueur Cointreau with LSD. He then observed the effects 
uh, on the men who drank it who did not know that they had been drugged. Olson's colleague, Vin Ruit, reported the following in a now declassified document. The experiment took place Thursday, November 19, 1953, in the evening. I saw Dr. Olson on Friday morning. We had breakfast, and he appeared to be agitated, and at the time I did not consider this to be abnormal under the circumstances. He'd been drugged the night before, <laughs> yeah. Right. The next time I saw Dr. Olson was on Monday morning, 23rd of November, 1953. I came to work about 7.30, and Dr. Olson was waiting for me in his office. He appeared to be agitated and asked me if I should fire him or should he quit. I was taken aback by this and asked him what was wrong. He stated that, in his opinion, he had messed up the experiment and did not do well at the meetings. I talked with Dr. Olson for about a half hour and further discussed it with him, stating that, in my opinion, he had the wrong impression, that I thought he did very well at the meetings and his participation in the experiment was above reproach. He appeared to be satisfied and relieved. We attended two professional appointments together, and I noticed nothing unusual, except that he appeared to have some difficulty in concentrating. The next time I saw him was the following morning, Tuesday, 24th November, 1953, when he again was waiting for me in my office when I came to work about 7.30 a.m. He appeared to be greatly agitated and, in his own words, all mixed up. He said he felt that he was not competent, that he had done something wrong. When questioned closely, he could not say exactly what he thought he had done wrong. After about an hour of discussion, it became apparent to me that Dr. Olson needed psychiatric attention. So the CIA arranged for Olson to see a psychiatrist. However, instead of taking him to a local one, they took him to New York City, where they brought him to Dr. Harold Abramson. And he was a psychiatrist. No, he was an allergist and a pediatrician. Huh. He was also working, though, for the CIA's MKUltra. Mm -hmm. In 1953, he proposed an $85,000 experiment, which was a lot of money back then, an $85,000 experiment to study the effects of LSD on unwitting hospital patients at Mount Sinai Hospital. They presumably took Olson to him because he had the security clearances and the need to know to discuss Olson's issues with his job, working with MKUltra. But Abramson was not a trained psychiatrist. That's just what they told people. So did Olson seem psychologically better after meeting with Abramson? No. Uh, Ruit reports that all along Olson had seemed very suspicious and ate and drank very little, as if his food might be drugged or poisoned. <laughs> not that he didn't have reason <laughs> to suspect that. After Olson met with Abramson, Ruit reports, Again, he appeared to be very anxious, upset, and kept asking, What's behind all this? Give me the lowdown. What are they trying to do with me? Are they checking me for security? Etc. I did my best to reassure him and tried to show him wherein factually he was imagining these difficulties and thought I'd convinced him. At least he said that he thought things were clearing up, and also he said that he thought Dr. Abramson could f help him. The next day, Wednesday the 25th, Olson had another meeting with Dr. Abramson. That night, he and his colleagues went to see a musical called Me and Juliet, but Olson became agitated and, during the intermission, said that he knew people were waiting outside to arrest him when he left the theater. Ruit assured him that he personally would get him back to Maryland in time for Thanksgiving dinner with his family, which was the plan. On Thanksgiving Day, they got as far as Washington, D.C. They flew from New York to Washington. But then, according to Ruit, Olson said he was ashamed to see his wife and family and wanted to go off by himself. Ruit said he couldn't let him do that, so Olson suggested he turn himself over to the police since they wanted him anyway. Ruit said the police didn't want him and finally convinced him of this fact. Then Ruit suggested that he go back and see Dr. Abramson in New York, and Olson agreed. So they phoned Mrs. Olson and let her know the new plan. At this point, uh, Ruit and Olson parted company with Olson being taken back to New York. According to Dr. Robert Lashbrook, Sidney Gottlieb's deputy in charge of MKUltra, Olson arrived back in New York and saw Dr. Abramson late on Thanksgiving afternoon. Then Lashbrook and Olson went to a restaurant for Thanksgiving dinner. Olson continued to act paranoid, believing everybody, including Lashbrook, was in a plot to get him. 
and he demanded to know what the plot was. Lashbrook also claimed Olson said he was guilty of security violations and, quote, on occasions had exceeded his interpretation of the need to know principle, close quote. So apparently he had dis- said he had disclosed some things he shouldn't have. On Friday, they went back to Dr. Abramson, who suggested that Olson be hospitalized, to which Olson eventually agreed, and they arranged to take him to a facility near Washington on Saturday. Back at the hotel on Friday night, Olson seemed to be feeling better, but still paranoid, and washed his dirty clothes. He also talked to his wife on the telephone and was feeling cheerful. Lashbrook said that he felt more relaxed and con- not only felt, but said he felt more relaxed and contented than he had since coming to New York. Then, according to Lashbrook, Somewhere around 0230 Saturday morning, I was awakened by a loud noise. Dr. Olson had crashed through the closed window blind and the closed window, and he fell to his death from the window of our room on the 10th floor of the Statler Hotel. Later in the day, I officially identified the body for the New York authorities. So that's the CIA's version of events. Olson was unwittingly dosed with LSD. He became unstable and paranoid over a period of 10 days. And when Lashbrook was asleep in the same room, he crashed through the window and fell to his death. Did the family accept this story? Kind of, sort of. Alice didn't want to reopen old wounds. She just wanted to let the family heal. Eric and the other children, though, were not satisfied, but they were stymied going further for almost two decades because Alice just wanted to move past this. So what changed uh, happened to change that? Alice passed on in 1993, and that let the children start pushing the investigation forward. In June of 1994, they had Frank Olson's body exhumed so it could be reburied next to their mother's. But they also had a criminologist and medical examiner, Professor James Stars, examine the body and perform a second autopsy. And what did Stars find? The initial 1953 autopsy had said there were lacerations or cuts on the body from where it went through the broken glass of the window. And the window was broken. But Stars' team looked for lacerations and couldn't find any. Also, even though Olson landed in the street on his back, Star's team found he also had a blunt force trauma injury to the head on the front of his skull, above the eyes. And although one member dissented, the majority of the team concluded that the wound to the front of the head and another wound on the front of the chest could not have been caused by the fall and must have been sustained when he was still in the hotel room. According to an article in the Baltimore Sun, James Stars, the George Washington University forensic pathologist who examined the body, concluded that Olson had suffered a blow to the head before he fell from room 1018A. He called the evidence rankly and starkly suggestive of homicide. So the new forensic pathologist says the evidence is rankly and starkly suggestive of homicide. Let that sink in. Oh, and in light of the new findings, the New York, uh, in New York, the chief medical examiner changed the cause of death from suicide to cuppy, cause unknown pending police investigation. Hmm. So did the authorities open a new investigation? Yes. In 1996, Eric Olson approached the U.S. District Attorney for Manhattan, uh, Robert Morgenthau, and the matter was referred to Stephen Sirocco of the Cold Case Unit. They did a new investigation, and Sirocco became convinced that there was foul play involved, but he didn't get enough evidence to bring an indictment. Needless to say, Eric was disappointed. Did he keep investigating on his own, though? Yeah, and he found something interesting. He contacted the CIA and got a copy of the organization's 1953 assassination manual, titled A Study of Assassination. And he had to specify the 1953 one because when he initially said, can I have your assassination manual? They said, which one? (laughs) (laughs) We'll have a link to the uh, 1953 assassination manual in the show notes so you can read it for yourself. 
it talks about different types of assassinations. For example, there are what are called simple assassinations, where the victim doesn't know that he's about to be killed, so it's simple to kill him. Then there are chase assassinations, where he realizes he's about to be killed, so you have, may have to chase him, but he's not being guarded by anybody. And then there are guarded assassinations where someone is guarding him, and so that's a little harder to kill him. Here's what the uh, manual says about one way of killing someone in secret. For secret assassination, either simple or chase, the contrived accident is the most effective technique. When successfully executed, it causes little excitement and is only casually investigated. The most efficient accident in simple assassinations is a fall of 75 feet or more onto a hard surface. Elevator shafts, stairwells, unscreened windows, and bridges will serve. Bridge falls into water are not reliable. In simple cases, a private meeting with a subject may be arranged at a properly cased location. The act may be executed by sudden, vigorous, word here excised, of the ankles, tipping the subject over the edge. In chase cases, it will usually be necessary to stun or drug the subject before dropping him. Care is required to ensure that no wound or condition not attributable to the fall is discernible after death. So that was the CIA's advice in 1953, the same year Olson died in a circumstance where the evidence was rankly and starkly suggestive of homicide. I mean, just think about this. The most effective way to kill someone in secret is drop them from 75 feet or more onto a hard surface. Arrange a private meeting with them in a properly cased location. If they knew they are about to be killed, stun them first, perhaps by hitting them on the forehead. Then grab them by their ankles and tip them up over the edge. When successfully executed, it causes little excitement and is only casually investigated. Just make sure no wound not attributable to the fall is discernible after death. You can imagine what Eric thought after reading this. So did Eric ever bring try bringing a suit against the CIA as a result of his own findings? Yes. In uh, 2012, he and his brother Nils, uh, their sister had died in an airplane accident, um, but he and Nils filed a suit in U.S. District Court in Washington, D.C., seeking unspecified damages and access to documents they believed the CIA was withholding from them. But the 1976 agreement that the family had signed got in the way. And the next year, the judge, uh, James Boasberg, dismissed the case. But in his ruling, Judge Boasberg wrote something very interesting. While the court must limit its analysis to the four corners of the complaint, the skeptical reader may wish to know that the public record supports many of the allegations in the family suit, far-fetched as they may sound. So the judge himself thought and went out of his way to point out that he thought the evidence was convincing. He just felt legally unable to let the suit proceed on technical grounds, partly because they'd signed an agreement saying they wouldn't sue. Did Eric ever find a way forward? He was now effectively stymied in criminal court and in civil court, but there was one more court he could turn to, the Court of Public Opinion. He therefore went to the journalist Seymour Hirsch of the New York Times. Hirsch had reported on the story years before, but he had bought the initial LSD story about why Olson died. So Eric went to him and demanded he take a new look at the evidence, and Hirsch said he would check into it. When he did so, Hirsch had a very reliable source check, and what he came back with was startling. The source apparently said that back in the 1950s, the U.S. intelligence apparatus had a mechanism in place for dealing with problematic citizens. This mechanism was used to stage other mysterious suicides of this period. And on a side note, several of these involved falls from high places that uh, we'll be talking about in the future. In any event, the mechanism was apparently used on Frank Olson. But before publishing these facts, Hirsch needed to get the information from more than one source, which is standard journalistic practice. But also, in this case, there was a special reason. 
if he were to publish what he knows right now, it would expose who the source was. As he explained in a video, people have to sign in for things. And so if his, it, apparently his source may have had to sign in for something to get access to this information, and if his is the only recent signature on record, it would burn him as the source. So whatever the details of that may be, Hirsch says he can't publish now what he knows until he can get confirmation from elsewhere, but he's working on that. So how did Eric take that? Apparently not very well at first. Uh, he really wanted Hirsch to publish. But Eric had one more way of getting to the court of public opinion. In 2017, Netflix made a six-part documentary series about all this called Wormwood. And it's available to watch on Netflix right now. Okay. So what theories do we have about the death of Frank Olson? We need to look at three types of mysteries. Uh, what role LSD played in his death? What was the cause of Frank Olson's death? And if it was homicide or murder, what was the motive? So looking at those kind of three mysteries on the first one, there are three basic theories regarding the role of LSD in the story. First, Olson had an LSD freak out, and that directly led to his death. Uh, second, he was given LSD but it wasn't a major factor in his death. Other factors were primary. And then third, he was never given LSD. That was just a CIA cover story. Uh, when it comes to the cause of his death, there are four basic theories. First, that it was an accident. That is, Frank Olson didn't mean to go through the window, but he did. Second, that it was a suicide, that Frank Olson deliberately killed himself. Third, that it was a homicide. That is, his colleagues didn't mean to kill Frank Olson, but something happened and he accidentally went through the window. And fourth, that it was premeditated murder, that his colleagues deliberately killed him. And then finally, if it looks like murder or homicide is the motive or is the cause, we'll look at uh, theories concerning the motives. All right. So what can we say about the death of Frank Olson from the faith perspective? Well, there are all kinds of moral questions surrounding this, uh, experimenting on people without their informed consent, using assassination to get rid of people, et cetera, et cetera. But these moral questions don't help us solve the mysteries regarding Olson's death. So there's not much to say from the faith perspective about the mysteries other than, you know, don't do bad stuff. <laughs> right. So what can we say about Frank Olson's death from the reason perspective? Let's start with a preliminary issue. The claim that he at least briefly survived the fall, that his eyes were open and he spoke, although unintelligibly. Some people might doubt whether that's possible. I mean, after all, the CIA manual says it recommends a drop of 75 feet or more. And he he falling from the 13th floor, if that if you estimate 10 foot, 10 feet per hotel floor, that would be 130 feet, almost twice what the CIA recommended as a fatal range. So could he have briefly survived that? Yeah. And in the show notes, we'll have a link to a story about a teenager who survived a 130-foot plunge from a bridge, and not just for a few moments, but who fully recovered. So that part of the story is not implausible. All right. What about the theories regarding the role of LSD in the story? It's certainly possible that he was given LSD. MK Ultra did involve giving people and lots of people LSD without their being aware of it. Uh, Sidney Gottlieb was totally capable of dosing his own colleagues and watching the effects. So that's not at all implausible. And if he was dosed, would it have directly led to his death? That's where the story gets harder to believe. Uh, the CIA would seemingly like us to think that he simply became unhinged and eventually suicidal after being dosed. But that almost never happens on LSD trips. I mean, people can have LSD flashbacks, but it's rare for a single dose to have such long-lasting effects on someone. I mean, remember, Olson didn't die until 10 days after he was dosed. And during that time, he wasn't continuously hallucinating, as the reports of his colleagues indicate. In fact, I haven't found mentions of him hallucinating on subsequent days at all. His colleagues do report him being paranoid, but... He had good reason to be paranoid, as <laughs> you know, as the saying goes, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get you. 
his colleagues really had drugged his food and drink, and he knew it. Uh, furthermore, if he was murdered, then they were in on a plot to get him. And if they were conducting such a plot, then we can't trust what they report about him when he was alone with them and away from his family. So in any, in any event, they don't describe him as suffering from an extended LSD trip. Uh, the effects of LSD, whether it's a good trip or a bad trip, typically wear off after 12 hours. And as far as I can tell, someone taking a single dose of LSD and then being suicidal 10 days later is basically unheard of. It would be far more likely if he were given LSD at all for the effects to wear off after the normal period of time. But being dosed may have made him angry enough that he started talking about his other dissatisfactions with work, and being unwittingly dosed may have made him naturally suspicious of his colleagues. I thus don't think that LSD played a direct role in what happened on the last night of his life. At best, it was a remote contributing factor. Is there reason to think that he may not have been dosed at all? It's, it's possible. The only evidence we have that he was dosed are the statements of his colleagues. And if they murdered him, we can't trust their statements. Also, as the interviewer in the Wormwood series points out, the LSD story is a way of letting the CIA take responsibility without really taking responsibility for his death. They get to say, yeah, we gave him LSD and he had a bad trip and he died and we're really sorry, but we didn't set out to hurt him and we certainly didn't kill him deliberately. If they did give him LSD, then the LSD story would be what in Spycraft is called a limited hangout. A limited hangout is what you do when your cover story falls apart and you have to start telling the truth. And uh, so what you do is you tell a limited amount of truth. You hang out just part of the truth so you can conceal the really damaging truths. In this case, the first cover story was that this was just an accident or a suicide. But then the Rockefeller Commission found out more was involved. So the CIA did a limited hangout by revealing the limited truth that they'd given Olson LSD in hopes of concealing the more damning truth that they killed him. Or maybe they never gave him LSD at all, and that's just an, another cover story. Or, third possibility, maybe they gave him LSD and it didn't do anything to him at all. There's one claim that suggests that Olson was resistant to LSD. And this is possible. I did some checking, and apparently there are people for whom LSD has little or no effects, even no matter how much you give them. In his book, The Men Who Stare at Goats, British journalist John Ronson reports a conversation he had with one of Olson's colleagues, a man named Norman Cornoyer. I saw Frank at, after he'd been given the LSD, he said. We joked about it. What did he say? I asked. He said, they're trying to find out what kind of guy I am, whether I'm giving secrets away. You were joking about it, I said? We joked about it because he didn't react to LSD. He wasn't tripping at all, I said? Nah, said Norman. He was laughing about it. He said, they're getting very, very uptight now because of what they believe I'm capable of. He really thought that they were picking on him because he was the man who might give away the secrets. So maybe Olson was given LSD and it had little or no effect on him. And that's why it contributed to his death. Let's talk about the theories regarding his death. What about the idea it was an accident? I'll let the night manager of the Hotel Statler speak to this one. His name was Armand Pastore, and he said, In all my years in the hotel business, he later reflected, I never encountered a case where someone got up in the middle of the night, ran across a dark room in his underwear, avoiding two beds, and dove through a closed window with the shade and curtains drawn. And I agree with him. I, it's very unlikely that Olson would get up in the middle of the night and stumble around the room with such force that he caused the head and chest injury to himself and then crashed through the window with both the blinds, the curtains, and the glass window itself all closed. And if he had been crashing around the room with that amount of force, it would have woken up Gottlieb's de deputy, Lashbrook, before he went through the window, not after like Lashbrook claimed. So the accident theory is very implausible. What about the suicide theory? 
Most of what we know or think we know about Olson's mood before his death is based on the reports of his colleagues, but they don't report him being suicidal. They report him being suspicious of them with good reason, but not ideating about his own death. Instead, they report him feeling better, particularly on the day he died. According to them, he was looking forward to starting a rest in the, in the hospital the next day. He was cheerily chatting with people on the phone. And according to Lashbrook, before they went to bed that night, he said he felt more relaxed and contented than he had since they'd come to New York. And we also aren't just limited to his colleagues' statements on this point, because he also had a conversation with his wife over the phone. And according to her, he wasn't saying goodbye. He was explaining what would happen next and saying he'll see her tomorrow. So why, at 2.30 in the morning, would he suddenly become suicidal when he had never been suicidal before and everything was pointing in the other direction? Also, if he did become suicidal, why wouldn't he do what a normal suicidal person would do? Open the curtains, open the blinds, open the window, and then climb out on the windowsill before jumping. It's not plausible that he would suddenly rush at a window with such force that he'd be confident he would go through the curtains, the blind, the glass, and somehow miss the wooden sash in the middle of the window. That's not a typical way to commit suicide. So the suicide theory is implausible. What about the idea that this was homicide but not murder? This theory would have us suppose that Olson got into some kind of altercation with his colleagues, that things got out of control, and that he ended up going through the window, even though that wasn't the plan. So they didn't plan to kill him, but it happened. Okay, fine. Uh, so what were they trying to do with him at 2.30 in the morning that led to this altercation? They already had a plan for what to do with him. He was going to be taken to a psychiatric hospital the next day. He'd agreed to check himself in, and he would be out of public sight under their watchful care. Other than trying to kill him, it's hard to think of a reason why they would need to roust him out of bed at 2.30 in the morning. But I know of one scenario that has been proposed. In his book, A Terrible Mistake, Investigative journalist H.P. Alberelli recounts a conversation with two CIA sources he refers to as Albert and Neil, obviously not their real names. According to them, the plan was to take Olson to the psychiatric hospital, but... At some point during Olson's last night in New York, Neil explained, Lashbrook had become concerned that Olson was once again becoming unhinged. Before Olson and Lashbrook retired for the night, the decision was made that it would be best if Olson were transported back to Maryland for confinement at Chestnut Grove, as Abramson had recommended, but by means other than the commercial flight Lashbrook had booked for the next day. According to Albert and Neil, when a late-night attempt was made to remove a subdued Olson from the room to transport him by automobile to Maryland, things went drastically wrong. The short and entire explanation is that Olson resisted and in the ensuing struggle, it was pitched through the closed window. So Alberelli says that his sources say they tried to drive Olson to the hospital that night, and he resisted and ended up going through the window. That's possible. But I don't think it's the most probable theory. Partly because they would have had to pitch him through just the lower part of the window, because the wooden sash across the middle was not broken. And that's pretty precise pitching for some guys struggling in a moment of frenzy. But also, I don't think it's the most probable theory because of a phone call that we'll discuss in a minute. So this brings us to the idea that this was a deliberate murder. What evidence do we have for that? Let's start with what happened just after his death. In his book, Poisoner in Chief, Stephen Kinzer writes... Police officers entered room 1018A with guns drawn. They saw no one. The window was open. They pushed open the door to the bathroom and found Lashbrook sitting on the toilet, head in hands. He'd been sleeping, he said, when I heard a noise and then I woke up. The man that went out the window, what is his name? One officer asked. Olson came the reply. Frank Olson. And you say you didn't see Mr. Olson go out the window? No, I didn't. You didn't think of going down to check on Mr. Olson? I looked out the window. I saw him lying there. There were people running from Pennsylvania Station. 
What could I have done? I could see that he had help. I thought it best to wait here. So that's kind of suspicious. Your colleague goes out the window, and rather than rushing down to check on him, you go to the bathroom, sit on the toilet, and put your head in your hands? Kind of like a man feeling guilty might do? Armand Pastore, the night manager of the motel, also thought this behavior was suspicious. The night manager who overheard this conversation was suspicious. Leaving the police officers, he returned to the lobby and, on a hunch, asked the telephone operator if any calls had recently been made from room 1018A. Yes, she replied, and she had eavesdropped, not an uncommon practice in an era when hotel phone calls were routed through a switchboard. Someone in the room had called a number on Long Island, which was listed as belonging to Dr. Harold Abramson. Well, he's gone, the caller had said. Abramson replied, well, that's too bad. Well, he's gone. That's how you tell the man's attending physician that his psychiatric patient is dead because he just leaped from a window? I mean, now, you might say that Lashbrook and Abramson were CIA employees, so they wouldn't have discussed matters openly over the phone. You know, the Romulans have broken code, too, and <laughs> especially knowing that in 1953, the hotel operator might be listening in. Fair enough, but well he's gone, is too guarded for this situation. Saying gone instead of dead doesn't protect anything. It's patently obvious to everyone the man on the sidewalk is dead or dying. And Lashbrook himself told the police the man was Frank Olson. Saying Frank Olson is dead would be a much more natural thing to say. Saying well he's gone is a stupid thing to say because it will only invite suspicion. It can even be read as confirmation of a plan that Abraham already knew about. In fact, look at Abraham's reply. That's too bad. Is that what you say when someone calls you at 2.30 in the morning and unexpectedly says, well, he's gone to you? Don't you say something like, wait, who are you talking about? Who is he? What do you mean gone? Is someone dead? Is it one of my patients? Are you talking about Frank Olson? On both Lashbrook and Abrams, Abramson's part, this thing sounds like a confirmation of a prearranged plan. The smart thing for them to have done would be for Lashbrook to get on the phone and start babbling excitedly about how Frank Olson has just leaped to his death and how it's so horrible. Then Abraham should have started cussing and acting shocked that one of his patients was dead. Well, he's gone and that's too bad, are ridiculously cool, calm, and collected things to say and just make it sound like this was totally expected and they both knew about it ahead of time. So Lashbrook's odd behavior, both when he made the phone call and when the police found him sitting on the toilet with his head in his hands, make him look suspicious. The apparent premeditation of the situation is why I don't think the accidental death during a struggle theory is the most likely possibility. Since Lashbrook was the last person known to be in the room with Olson, does that mean he killed him? Probably not, and for several reasons. First, he didn't act panicked or out of breath when the police found him, not like a man who just attacked and forced another man out a window, especially lugging the body after giving him a blunt force trauma wound to the head and to the chest. Also, Lashbrook was a physically thin, unintimidating man. And he was an administrator and a researcher. Whacking people wasn't his job. If the CIA wanted Olson dead, it's far more likely they would have called in a professional rather than leave it to a weak amateur like Lashbrook. I mean, after all, the CIA has assassins in its pay. That's why it had an assassination manual in 1953 so it would call one of them in. The far more likely scenario is that Lashbrook knew the hit was coming, let the assassins into the room, they told him to stay in the bathroom, then they assaulted Olson and defenestrated him. That's the technical term for throwing someone out a window, defenestration. Such a cool word. Yes. And then they left. This now looks like a murder. So if the CIA defenestrated Olson, what was the motive? Well, let's think about what Frank Olson knew. He was a bacteriologist working on biological warfare projects for the Army, so he knew about those. 
also, there were charges at the time that the U.S. was using biological warfare in the Korean War, which was happening at the time. Some captured American soldiers admitted this, but on repatriation, they denied it and said the confessions were coerced. Of course, that could have been because the retractions were coerced. So which right. way is it? <laughs> Someone's coercing here, but it's hard to say who. Whether or not it happened, and there is some evidence suggesting the U.S. really did use bioweapons in Korea, if Frank Olson believed that bioweapons had been used, whether they were or not, and if he was prepared to talk about it, it would have been extremely damaging to the U.S. I mean, to have headlines saying, Army scientists says we're using bioweapons in Korea. That would have been incredibly bad. He also was working on MKUltra, formerly known as Project Artichoke, and its purpose wasn't just feeding people LSD. They were researching interrogation methods and how to get information out of people who didn't want to give it up. One technique was by giving them LSD and getting them to hallucinate and asking them questions, but they were also working with hypnotism and shock, electric shock, and torture, and those sessions could get rough involving sometimes death. Uh, back over to John Ronson. At some point during his investigation, Eric hooked up with the British journalist Gordon Thomas, who has written numerous books on intelligence matters. Through Thomas, Eric learned that during a trip to London in the summer of 1953, his father had apparently confided in William Sargent, a consultant psychiatrist who advised British intelligence on brainwashing techniques. According to Thomas, Frank Olson told Sargent that he had visited secret joint American-British research installations near Frankfurt, where the CIA was testing truth serums on expendables, captured Russian agents and ex-Nazis. Olson confessed to Sargent that he had witnessed something terrible, possibly a terminal experiment on one of the or more of the expendables. Sargent heard Olson out and then reported to British intelligence that the young American scientist's misgivings were making him a security risk. He recommended that Olson be denied further access to Port and Down, the British chemical weapons research establishment. Then there's what Olson's colleague Norman Cornoyer told Eric. Ronson reports. Norman told Eric that the artichoke story was true. Frank had told Norman that they didn't mind if people came out of this or not. They might survive, they might not. They might be put to death. Eric said Norman declined to go into detail about what this meant, but he said it wasn't nice. Extreme torture, extreme use of drugs, extreme stress. Norman told Eric that his father was in deep and horrified... Let me restart that. Norman told Eric that his father was in deep and horrified at the way his life had turned. He watched people die in Europe, perhaps even helped them die, and by the time he returned to America, he was determined to reveal what he had seen. There was a 24-hour contingent of Quakers down at the Fort Dietrich Gates, peace protesters, and Frank would wander over to chat with them, much to the dismay of his colleagues. Frank asked Norman one day, Do you know a good journalist I can talk to? And so, Eric said, slipping LSD into his father's cointreau at the Deep Creek Lodge was not an experiment that went wrong. It was designed to get him to talk while hallucinating. And Frank failed the test. He revealed his intentions to Gottlieb and the other MK Ultra men present. This was the terrible mistake he had made. Seeing Martin Luther on the Sunday night had made him all the more determined to quit his job. Here I stand, I can do no other. And on the Monday morning, Frank did indeed tender his resignation, but his colleagues persuaded him to seek psychological counseling in New York. And when Ronson himself talked to Norman, this happened. Was he going to talk to a journalist, I asked? He came so close it wasn't even funny, said Norman. So there you have it. According to Norman Cornoyer, Olson was going to talk to reporters about MKUltra, the torture and the deaths, and maybe biological warfare for all we know. And when the CIA couldn't dissuade him or bring him under control, they had motive to kill him. So, Jimmy, what's your bottom line on this uh, mystery about Frank Olson? I think the accident and suicide stories are very unlikely. I think the unintentional homicide theory is possible, but not necessarily probable. And I think the most likely scenario is probably that Frank Olson was killed because he was considered a security risk 
in the McCarthy phase of the Cold War. So is there more to know about this story? Yeah, there's a bunch. Um, I've simplified things for this episode to just let you hear the main through line of the story, but there's more to know. And I'll have several book recommendations. One that I want to mention in particular is H.P. Alberelli's A Terrible Mistake. The CIA actually has a review of this book on its website. In this case, the review is by a man named Hayden Peek. The CIA periodically pays people to write reviews of books that are critical of the agency, and it's always interesting to read such reviews. Uh, you'd think that the agency-paid reviewers would be as neutral as possible to avoid charges of prejudice or lying on behalf of the agency. You'd also expect them to go after major flaws in the books, pointing out that, you know, anything they can that's a flat-out verifiable falsehood. So if they don't name verifiable falsehoods, it's significant. And with those points in mind, let's hear the two paragraphs of the CIA book review of A Terrible Mistake that deal with the merits of Alberelli's case. That, in short, is the Alberelli account. Has he got it right? The author's endnotes suggest the answer. There aren't any worthy of the name, and some chapters have none at all. With a very few exceptions, the book's many quotes, pages of dialogue, and the documents described cannot be associated with references listed in the notes. Moreover, some notes cover topics not even mentioned in the chapter they are tied to. With such notes, readers will be left wondering how to know what Alberelli writes is accurate. Potential readers should also know that less than a third of this book is about the Olson case. The balance is a rehash of CIA mind control experiments that have been in the public domain for years. Alberelli struggles mightily to link the program and Olson's death with North Korean brainwashing, the Kennedy assassination, attempts on Castro's life, the mafia, Watergate, the suicides of James Forstall, James Cronthal, a CIA officer, and Bill Hayward, an associate producer of Easy Rider, and the death of William Colby. But it is all speculation, and the sourcing of this part of the book is as bad as the rest. Conspiracy theorists will no doubt overlook these weaknesses. Those who demand documentation for such serious charges will discover that investing time to find it in Alberelli's narrative would be a terrible mistake. Huh. I love how fair and neutral the tone is, particularly <laughs> when Hayden Peake turns the knife at the end, saying it would be a terrible mistake for people to demand documentation from Alberelli's book, A Terrible Mistake. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> also, I love how far Hayden Peake is able to stick in the knife. The biggest thing he can find to complain about are not verifiable falsehoods. It's the number and kind of footnotes that he isn't happy with. That's the biggest thing he has to complain about. So is there anything else to say? One final note, in reviewing the documents that the CIA director, William Colby, gave the Olson family in 1975, I happen to notice that the first document in the collection, dated to 1953, was titled Memorandum for the Case File X866287. So this was literally an X-File. <laughs> I want to believe! <laughs> All right, Jimmy, what further resources can we offer to the listeners? Well, uh, since we just mentioned it, a, the book A Terrible Mistake, The Murder of Frank Olson by H.P. Alberelli. Also, John Ronson's book, The Men Who Stare at Goats, which is where I first learned, I think it's where I first learned about uh, the Olson case quite a number of years ago. The This book also deals with the U, U.S. Stargate psychic spying program, which, yes, we'll talk about in future episodes. Also, the new book Poisoner in Chief by Stephen Kinzer, which is a biography of Sidney Gottlieb, the head of MKUltra. And yes, we'll be talking about him and MKUltra in the future. There's also the 1975 Rockefeller Report on CIA, CIA activities. There's the Netflix six-part documentary series Wormwood. There's the website The Frank Olson Project, where they have, among other things, those declassified CIA documents. We'll have Wikipedia articles on Project Artichoke, MK Ultra, LSD, the concept of a limited hangout, also the 1953 CIA assassination manual, whether or not the U.S. used biological warfare during the Korean War, 
the a link to the CIA review of a terrible mistake, so you can read the whole review for yourself. Wikipedia on Frank Olson and on the Rockefeller Commission. A 1975 New York Times article by C- Seymour Hirsch. A link to a, that story I mentioned about a, queen, a teen surviving a 130-foot jump from a Queensboro Bridge or from the Queensboro Bridge, and then a 2012 Baltimore Sun article on all this. Excellent. So, Jimmy, uh, now let's move on to our mysterious feedback. And uh, this is going to come from our episode on the third secret of Fatima, the part one of that. Uh, This comment comes from G.I.Y.J. on YouTube. Jimmy Aiken, the third secret of Fatima, episode number 64. This was the same number of years from May 13th, 1917, the first apparition at Fatima, to May 13th, 1981, when Pope John Paul II was shot. So, I had no idea that that was the case. (laughs) I did not plan to have episode 64 be on the third secret of Fatima in light of the fact that there were 64 years between May 13th, 1917 and the assassination attempt on May 13th, 1981. So, I would say that's a providential coincidence. Yes. I mean, we timed it for the October 13th anniversary. Anniversary, but not... Yeah. To be episode 64. I mean, we would have had to have thought of that when we were starting the production of this more than a year ahead of time. And we were we didn't plan to. I'm not neither. Jimmy, you may be that organized, but I'm certainly not. <laughs> no, I would to to bend a, a line from John Paul II. A mother's hand affected the course of the show. There you go. Uh, James writes on Facebook. These two episodes knocked it out of the park. Sorry for the sports analogy should be required listening for anyone who thinks there's some conspiracy behind the secrets. Thank you so much, James. Uh, You know, on this, as with everything else, we really try to be thorough and balanced and just let the evidence goes where it points. And in this case, it's not to the third secret or part of it still being hidden. So, Jimmy, what do we have for mysterious headlines? Well, since uh, this was a Cold War and mind control related episode, I thought I would have a couple of related stories for mysterious headlines. Uh, You may remember a while back, there were a bunch of people in Cuba who got sick as a result of the American embassy in Cuba who thought they had been subject to a sonic attack. Well, maybe it was a neurotoxin from insecticide according to a new study. And so we'll have a link to that. Mm. Also, a uh, an article from The Guardian over in, over in the UK saying, why is the U.S. still using hypnosis to convict criminals? Mm. And I totally agree. Hypnosis is unreliable as a memory aid. It should not, it, evidence from hypnosis should not be admissible in court. All right. Uh, so, Jimmy, in a second, I'm going to ask you about what our next episode is going to be about. But first, uh, I want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including Adika L., Tom V., Randy L., Afton R., and Paul C. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. So, Jimmy, what's our next episode going to be about? Well, next Friday is a fifth Friday, so we're going to be having a fifth Friday Weird Questions episode, and that'll cover a lot of different uh, interesting topics. And then the week after that, the first week in December, we're scheduled to talk about Tamam Shud, or the Summerton Man. It's a another mysterious death, this time set in Australia, and hopefully we'll be hearing from our friends, the Catholics of Oz. Excellent. So that's it from us. What did you think about this discussion of the mysterious death of CIA scientist Frank Olson? Let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akins Mysterious World Facebook page. Send us an email to mysterious at sqpn.com or send a tweet to at mys underscore world with the hashtag of mysterious feedback. Be sure to share the podcast with your friends and to write a review in Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcast from to help us keep growing this community of listeners, as you can tell, when we have a large community, the larger the community of listeners, the better the feedback, the, the more interesting we get uh, discussions and we get ideas. So we'd love to have more and more people share this, and we depend on you to reach more people. 
You can find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion and links to the mysterious headlines on our show notes at sqpn.com slash mysterious. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest. <laughs>